I would like, of course, to, uh, to focus a little bit today. Um, the topic I've chosen to talk about is conditionality. Conditionality. Now, that, that seems somewhat of a big word, but it's not necessarily so. Is the, the, the word to mean the quality of being conditional or limited? This is it. It's a quality of being conditional or limited or limitations by certain terms. Listen to what I'm saying again. What we're looking at today is how we have been limited. There's limitation uh, by certain terms, a state of being subject to conditions. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective because I think about life itself. Life is made up of conditions and limitations. Is that true? Not true? Yeah. I mean, think about from the creation. When God made the first man, there were conditions on him staying in the garden. There were conditions in him remaining happy. There were conditions. Is that not, is that not right? So it's a way of life, as far as I'm concerned. Conditions are a way of life. They exist on every level. Um, in our homes, there are conditions. In, in, in our churches, there are conditions. In, in society, um, there, there are conditions as, as well. And if these conditions are not met in the home, then we have a split. There's a divorce that takes place, and, and there's a split. If it's not met in the church, then you know what happens is this fellowship meant. And you're disfellowshipped from from the from the body. And if, if in society you don't meet certain conditions, then well, the consequences can vary. You can be imprisoned. You can be ticketed. You can be so much can happen. And then we think we think to live in our homes, to live in your home, you have to pay your conditions. You have to pay the rent, or pay the mortgage, or pay the government to live in your own home. And you think you own your home. And I told you how um, I'm thinking, oh, I own, I, I own my home. And got a call one day um, from the from the tax um, collectors. And they said, how are you? Yes, sir. Um, I have a, a warrant for you. I have a warrant to be served. A warrant? Even my knees got weak. I had to sit down. What is that warrant for? Oh, taxes that weren't paid last year. How much is it, sir? $6,000. From Jamaican. From Jamaican dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was a warrant out for me because I didn't pay six thousand dollars. But it's my home. But the government said if not, if, if I don't pay, it's not. I was just talking about how that if you if if, if you if you live in a home that you, if there are conditions to you remaining there. If you have um, electricity, there are conditions with, with you maintaining that connection. So you know what I'm saying? So I'm just suggesting to you that there is a necessity. In every prayer of life, there is a necessity of um, limitations, we say, but conditions is the better word. Because limitations might, might not fully describe the, the truth of conditions, or the conditions also are also limitations. Right? Yes. Yeah. Anyway, um, there, there is also the perspective of knowledge. Now, my father-in-law um, is well known for this phrase. Um, and, and, and this is a phrase that he always uses. He said, the greatest is to know. The greatest in life is to know. And um, we already made fun of, of, of him. But when you, when, you, when you stop to think about it, you realize that is great wisdom. Because the greatest in life is to know. Knowledge is very important. Because if you're not aware, are you liable? If you're not aware, how can you do something or, or um, obey if you're not aware? All right. <laughs> I've, I've had that conversation with a policeman who stopped me once and he said, Sir, your brake light on one side of the vehicle is out. And I said, I said, Officer, how would I know that, that the, 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 the brake light at the back is, is, is out and I'm in the front of the vehicle? Mm -hmm. And he said, Sir, it is your duty to know. He said, and he said, it's giving me a ticket. And he said, it's your duty to know that your rear line is out, right? So, I mean, I was trying to, 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 you, you were saying, <laughs> right? But then he said, it's my duty. And he's right. Because you're saying, well, I can't step on the brake and check the light. He said, that's not my problem. That's your problem. But your, your, your part is to make sure that the lights are working. So, anyway, I'm just saying that knowledge, Knowledge is important because knowledge of the conditions is what gets you to the place of compliance. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not even sure that complex is the right word, but, 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 but you, you get the point. Uh, anyway, what is knowledge, really? What is knowledge? When we say knowledge is to know, the greatest is to know, but what is it? Awareness. All right, awareness. So familiarity, awareness, understanding gained through experience or study, that's what knowledge is. All right, so in order to fulfill the conditions that are placed on us in whatever realm, there must be knowledge, all right? And, um, and I told you that, that knowledge and information, even though they are not, they are necessary, they are not, they are not most times enough to effect change. Because a lot of people just think that they know that is wrong, that they know is wrong. Is that true? A lot of people, they do think, they know it is wrong, but they still do it. So I realized that knowledge and information is, is not enough to effect change. Um, and I think one of the real reasons behind that is the fact, is the nature of man. The nature of man is, is something that man's nature is always to go against, um, against what could be done. It's always to, to be in, in opposition to, to, um, to what should be done. Um, my, my wife told me that, um, she went to, to, to the police station um, a couple of days ago, and she said when she went around there, she saw a lot of motorcycles. She said she saw about 50 motorcycles in one place. And we were discussing how that these motorcycles are not, um, they're not fit for the road. They are not legal for the world road. There's no insurance. It's not licensed. They just buy a motorcycle because they're cheap now, and they're coming in from China. They just buy a motorcycle and they just ride. And this one, the police take that one away. What do you think they do? They just buy another car. And so, you know, they, they, they so that's what I'm just showing you that you, you buy something and you think it is yours. It's not yours because there are conditions um, um, upon you riding and, and being on the road. And that has to do with your license, your fitness, your insurance, and all of that. And if those things are not um, up to date, then they will confiscate your, 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 your vehicle. Um, all right. Now, I want to look at something called flawed knowledge. And when we look at that perspective of flawed knowledge, what we're looking at is we are, we are using the implication, the word flawed uh, is the implication of imperfection and effectiveness. Um, now, while I can clearly prove this to be happening in the educational field, but I can clearly prove that this, this, this flaw of knowledge is taking place even in, in medicine and, and, and our understanding of, of, of the body and how it operates and all of that. Uh, I don't really want us to dwell on that today, but I want to talk about it a little bit. I want to bring your focus into the spiritual realm. Because if your knowledge in the spiritual realm is flawed, then there is eternal consequences. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Now, can you can you claim ignorance? Yes, you can. Um, Acts 17 talks about that in your ignorance, God waits up. But now, command it be everywhere, every man of you. Command it be everywhere, every man to repent. All right, I think that's done probably the other way around. In other words, how can, how can you repent except you know that you're in the wrong? How can you? He's saying now. Before you could claim ignorance, before you could say, I didn't know, but he says, but now, knowledge is of such that we can each understand and know. If we choose, is that correct? If we choose to open the door and take it, open it um, I want us to, to examine uh, an Old Testament passage. I, I, I look, that I got to Brother Reggie uh, when Brother Reggie was doing uh, his presentation. Something, something popped out of me in a reference that he made. It was a short reference, and and um, and I'd like for us to just go there and look at that now. Um, if you're able to open the Bible on the, and you can go ahead. I, I want to go to the Old Testament. I want us to think about something that that was said here in Isaiah 58. Um, And let's look at a couple of verses here, starting in verse um, 6, I think. I think it be it in verse 6. Now, remember, we're talking about what now? Flawed knowledge, remember? Flawed knowledge. And, and, and again, let me just reiterate this fact that if in the spiritual realm your knowledge is flawed, that they, then you will run a great term risk of what now? Eternal loss. Eternal loss. 
and um, there, there's nothing greater than that. If you if you lose out on eternal life, then there's nothing greater than losing out on eternal life. Is that making sense to you? Yeah. Right. I mean, we can all enjoy um, life for the moment, for the, this moment. And, and you know, thank you, guys. I just even this morning, I'm just realizing how fragile we are. Right, and you think you think you're a monster, you think you're a big, you think maybe your money puts you somewhere, your fame puts you somewhere. But yeah, I was going to ask you this morning about that. My back started acting, and I I bent down, I stooped down to do something, and then this pain gripped me, man, and I had to cry out, cry out, I couldn't move, I couldn't move. I was in pain, and so I had to cry out, and my poor wife had to run, and then I said, she, she don't know what to do. And I'm to be instructed here, and I'm thinking, man, we're nothing. We are nothing. If we think that we are something, we're nothing. But you don't realize this until uh, things change. Pain comes, suffering comes, sickness comes, right? And um, there, I'm sure some of us are more, more aware of that than, than some are, for sure. Now, um, so here, here, here's my point. Let's go to Isaiah 58, and, and I'm looking at the, uh, a couple of verses here, because Isaiah was bringing forth something that the Lord gave him as it relates to the people. Because the people were fasting according to what they were saying. They were fasting and so on, and then he was telling them what their fast was all about. But look what he says in verse 6. Let's go together. We're, if we read that to study, if you read along with me, I'm sure that it will be more beneficial. Um, just listening. Oh, you don't have anybody? Okay. All right, so um, okay, let's start in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To do what now? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that will break every yoke. So he's saying, This is the far, this is not the far. And take let's keep going. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, that thou seest the naked, that thou covers him, and that thou feed not thyself from thy own flesh? These are questions he's asking. In fact, all of these questions have to do with the fast that he's chosen. Are you seeing the point? Now he's saying in verse 8, um, he said, Then, when these things have happened, when you have done these things, when you have followed to do these things, and you're keen about what these things are, when you're doing the right fast, he said, Then, what will happen? Shall I forth as the morning, and thy help shall spring forth speedily. And thy righteousness shall go before thee, and what else? And the glory of the Lord shall go behind thee. It shall be thy rare reward. So it's not rare reward for the Lord, it's re reward. What is that? The glory of the Lord will be behind you, it will be a protection behind you. Um, so that's really what he was saying. Then he says, verse 9 Thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, and if, verse 10 says what, if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and do what else? Satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness as the noon today. And the Lord shall guide thee, verse 11 says, continually, and satisfy thy soul in draw. And make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. All right, so we say amen. Awesome. But then, uh, honestly, how many of us have ever taken this passage, uh, this passage, and 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 and, and dissected the passage to see the things that are said, that are being said there, and how true are these things? Are they true? Is it, are the things we just read true? Why then aren't, aren't we seeing the then, the then shall, then shall? It's the condition. You see what I'm saying? It's like that. What we just looked at is a conditional, is a conditional, is what? Or is that condition? It's condition. Oh, yes. Then we are seeing the conditional, um, and the conditionality of what we just read. In other words, if you do, this will happen. So what if you don't? Do what happen? 
It doesn't happen. So here's my question. If it doesn't happen, why do we cry to the Lord and say, Lord, why is this not happening for me? All right, so Sister, Sister Sonia said something that's important. Um, she said it's the Old Testament that isn't the truth that we do say that um, in the Old Testament, uh, the, 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 the focus of the Old Testament is about your doing and receiving. But isn't the same thing in the New Testament? You realize in the New Testament, you have to do to get what is the do in the New Testament? It's making it. It's not the truth. So in the Old Testament, you do or you obey. In the Old Testament, you say, if you obey my voice, I will do this. In the New Testament, what is it? It's not that what you obey, just to say, it's obey. We say, it's believing. We say in the New Testament, you believe it is faith that gives. And faith that knows, right? What is faith really? Is not believing God? Is not doing what God says? Is that what faith means? Is that what, that what faith is? Is that is it not true that faith coming by hearing by the word? Is that the same perspective? All right. So I, I want to consider then one phrase that I saw that made that 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 that, that I think the scriptures gave me a hunch in my in my spirit. Um, I look I look at that verse in verse nine, that phrase in verse nine, and let, let's look back at it with me. Verse nine, the same passage we just read. And um, I thought, if thou draw out thy, thy, thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the fitted soul. Uh, no, no, verse 9, I said 9, I just read it. Then shall thou call in the Lord and answer, thou shalt cry, and they shall say, Here I am. Look at what he said next. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke. Here's my question. What is the yoke? All right, the bondage. What is the yoke? What is the putting toward of the finger and speaking vanity? Because the yoke is tied to that. You see that? The yoke is tied to the putting toward of the finger and speaking vanity. What is this yoke? Because he says, if thou shalt do what now? Take away from your midst the yoke. The answer to that question is in the New Testament. <laughs> very interesting. The answer to that question is in the New Testament. I think the New Testament offers a very, very clear answer to this yoke that we're looking at. So, so go with me um, as we look at the Hebrews, and, and I'm just going to remind you of a couple of things. And in, in the Hebrews, so we are, I never set my, my time, my 45 minutes, but no problem. Um, well, Oh, but well, I do have a timer in the in the in the All right, so um, you know, so you're, you're you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, and, and I want to specifically talk about Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11 is that great hall of faith. Is the hall of fame for the people who are in faith, and how that these people by faith did some awesome things. Maybe we can just run up there to Hebrews 11. Um, if you can put that on the screen for me, I'd appreciate that. Hebrews 11. I want to read a couple of verses, starting in verse 32. Hebrews 11. I just wanted to, I was, I, I, I'm, I'm doing all the things that he did, and I mean, saying all the things that he said. The writer of Hebrews, I believe, to be Paul. Um, some people are having a challenge. Who really wrote Hebrews? Some said that they don't know. I believe Paul is in the audience. It doesn't matter. But the author of Hebrews here, having, having mentioned the, the people that he mentioned, um, said this, starting in verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, so he had to of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and of the prophets. In other words, all of these men were also men of faith. And that's true, that's what he's saying, right? Yes. Who, who, speaking of these men, all through faith, did what? Subdued the kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the, from the violence of the fire. And escaped the edge of the sword. All the weakness were made strong. Was violent in fire, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women, this time, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Who have we thought of that one? We were, we were thinking about the raising of the dead and we were thinking of being, being, being taken out of, of persecution. But look at what, what it says. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And other than child of court markings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawed and sundered, 
they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they were they were wandering about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Isn't that an interesting report that these people who were who were for God and then moved by God were able to, to endure a lot of these things? Now, so you're thinking, how how does my little child here in life compare to these people? Mm. Well, let me tell you something. These people, their child in life, were not the child that we were going through. Because they endured it for the name of God. They endured it for the kingdom of God. They endured it for the faith in God. We are, it's not because of our faith in God where we endure the thing that we're enduring. Sometimes the wrong, wrong actions that we made were made in life. Sometimes it is just things are not going the way that they should be going because we're not trusting God enough. But these people through faith, I mean, I find it was interesting that they would choose not to accept deliverance from their torture, from their persecution. Just to obtain a better resurrection. I mean, I think of somebody like Peter who said, I am not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. So turn me upside down, history says. That he volunteered to be turned upside down and be crucified upside. I mean, isn't that the worst way? I mean, to be crucified is at least your 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 organs and all of that are you're not under under stress in any way. Uh, I mean, yes, it would be under, but I mean not as much. But when you're turned upside down, this is all, I mean, it's, it's worse. But that you have chosen that, 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 that way instead of the other way proves that they had a different level of understanding that gave them a different level of experience, that gave them a different level of, um, of, of, of testimony. You know what I'm saying? All right. So with this said, Paul ends this chapter, the last two verse, by saying, all of these obtain a good report by faith. And I want another word there, by faith alone. Because the last verse says that God had, had prepared for us some better things. Mm -hmm. What are those better things? Imagine that you and I have better things than those people have with that experience. Sometimes I look at this and you know one of these for your own self? That tells that the people in the Old Testament have some great testimony. And we in the New Testament that have better things have such little testimony. That in the New Testament, people are very prepared. Well, let me, let, 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 let me exclude the, the, the New Testament, um, uh, the, the other apostles and the New Testament church, because I think they, they were, they, when, it, when we're thinking about New Testament power, we have to go back to Acts of the Apostles, we have to go back to the New Testament to see what happened in the New Testament. But to think about you and me that we are today have been given something better than these people that we just mentioned had, it's just an amazing thing because we don't see the corresponding works. We don't see the corresponding experiences that we should have, the greater experiences. I mean, you read, and I'm sure all of us have read, all that, um, that, that they, 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 um, all that they, 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 those who believe, Jesus says, he that believe on me, the works that I do, shall you do also read them for? Greater works than he shall do. Where are those greater works? Where is even the same works? But Paul says here that um, we have been given something new, something better. And it goes now to the next um, chapter, which is the next, the first two verses of the next chapter, chapter 12 of Hebrews. And I'm going to show you some here something. Because here Paul is now making reference um, to what we just looked at. Wherefore, seeing we, verse 1, Hebrews 1, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What is the great cloud of witnesses? All that you just said that. All that chapter that we talked about. All, that, I mean, all of those people. We, we have that great cloud of what now? Witnesses. Look at what he says to us. Let us. New Testament people, people who are, who are alive today, um, in 2023, this is what, um, Saturday the 23rd of September. What is the rapture day? 23rd. Yeah, actually, yeah. This is the secret rapture day. I think that's what it's supposed to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see my, my friend share, so I'm wondering, you better give him a call to see if he's, he's around. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so, so look at it now. 
seeing, seeing that, that we, we are so compassed with all with this great cloud of weakness, what are we supposed to do? Let us lay aside what? Wait, and what else? And the thing, look at what it says, and what now? The thing which does so easily beset us. And let us do what? Once to raise the patience, that is, I'm sorry, when you think to raise that is said for us. Next one, let's just throw that in. Looking on to Jesus, the author, the author, and who, and finish of your faith. For who by the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despite the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, so so a full mouthful here in this one verse. It's, it's, it's an interesting verse, but I told you that I have found in this verse some answers to what we just looked at um, in. In the previous chapter, we have a question, my sister. Go ahead. Please. All right. The question has to do. The question has to do with this joy that was set before him. How did he? How did he see that as joy? Um, what was what was ahead of him? Or is the result? All right, so it's the result. The joy that was before is what you would have accomplished for humankind. What you would have accomplished for you and for you and me, what you would have, you would have accomplished for all of us, which is what now? Salvation. All right, so let's start with this perspective because Paul here throws the, the, the entire scenario in the, in, the in the perspective of a race. And he says, that when you're in a race, that you have to put aside every weight. And I suppose that is why um, they, they run in very light, light oh, clothing, okay. very skimpy things. And sometimes that I'm wondering, like these ladies, man, can you just not just dress better? But I yeah. guess it's the perspective, the perspective is laying every weight. weight. Everything that will pull you back, everything that will keep you um, down, you should lay all of that aside. And so I, I guess that is why the, the, they're all um, running tight clothing, they, they're running in tights. Um, mm -hmm. Short tights or whatever. I don't think that are, are clothes that is that is right. So you don't want any, anything loose that the wind will hold you back. So he said we have to lay aside every weight, but he, 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 he links together with the weight. What else? And the thing, the thing that's so easy to be said. So here's my question. I'm, pro I'm proposing to you that the sin and the yoke are the same thing. I'm proposing to you that the sin and the yoke are the very same thing. All right. So let's let 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 me use a story. Let me use a story to, to bring us to an answer that I'm hoping you will agree with. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use a story that is in, in Matthew chapter 17. It's in Mark chapter 9. It's in Luke chapter 9. So we're familiar with the story. The story is a man with a demon possessed boy coming to find Jesus and just finding out that Jesus was not there. He was gone up to the mountains, but he still had nine disciples down there. So it was not a problem because even though he wasn't there, um, there were his representative, not just that, his disciples. These were his followers. They knew, everybody knew that these were his followers. So this man brought his son to these, um, these followers of Jesus. And what was the result? They could not pass them all. Well, faith would have it that Jesus came down from the mountain in time before that man had to go back home with his son. Yeah. And so he came down from the mountain and he saw the crowd. He didn't know what was happening. He asked him, What is happening over there? Because obviously there was a big uh, in Jamaica, we said there, there, there was a, a, a rock was being kicked up over there. Um, at, among the Pharisees. And so he asked them, what is taking place here? I want you to go with me to, to, to the answer um, that, that, are, uh, that is in Matthew 17. So go to Matthew 17. Let's look at verses 19 through to 21. Matthew 17. I want you to see the answer. In fact, I want you to see something that happened to the disciples. And I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate so much what happened to them because they were looked upon like fools. Right? And I suppose there were even people there saying, you see, I can't believe nothing about Jesus. I suppose.
suppose there were people there that were saying that, that you people, you people have to depend on Jesus. If Jesus wasn't here, what would you do? Right? But they went out before and did it. Right? Mm -hmm. So I want you to think, maybe something to say, but I want you to think about something. Um, they did something right. They realized that something was missing. They realized that something was lacking. They realized that they failed. They didn't resign to survive. <laughs> what they did, they came to him in private. Look what he said in verse 17. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart. That's what the word means. And said what? Why could we not be cast in all? All right. So wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be, be, be nice if we, if we did something, we prayed for somebody, it never happened, and we all came to Jesus to pray and say, Lord, we don't know what happened, but we need answers. We can't leave until we get an answer for what we what we what where we pay. You, you understand what I'm saying? So I appreciate the fact that they went to get answers. They knew their faith. They knew things didn't go as they planned. So they came and said, tell us, well, why could we not do this? And I want you to see the answer of Jesus. Because I think the answer of Jesus is still true throughout all ages. Look at it coming up in verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, please read with me now what Jesus said. Was the reason they could not cast that demon out. What is the reason now? 20. Because, because of what? Who's on me? Your unbelief, the disciples unbelief. For very key point, for very answer to you, what now? And the rain must start seeing. You shall say unto this mountain, you shall do what? Say to this mountain. Read that again. You shall say to this mountain. The easy way. You shall not say to God about your mountains. And that's what we do. We say. God, here's a mountain. You are such a wonderful father. God, you're so powerful. There's nothing, there's no one that, that is more powerful than you in the universe. And we're saying to him about mountain when Jesus said, eh, eh, that's not what you're supposed to do. We have to say to the mountain what? Remove, remove it to the other place. And what happens? It shall remove. And whatever. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, honestly, was that um, to us or was it just to the disciples? This, this, this answer here, was it to us or just to the disciples? Isn't it true that it's any time that we fail in, in, in praying and, and getting answers from the Lord, the, the, the reason is on belief? Yeah. It is. Go ahead, my sister. All right, the next verse is hope. Yes, we're going to that verse, but. So, so, so. Oh, so let's read the verse. Since your question is based on the next verse. Okay, so let's read the next verse. Uh, verse 21. How many? Mm -hmm. This kind of going out of what, what now? Right. By prayer. That's fast. All right, so go ahead with the question. Could this be connected to Isaiah 58 when the verse is that this is the fast that I have chosen? And the other question I'd like to ask. This unbelief is it a yoke based on the what you have described? Right. So, so what uh, I think she's probably just, just helping me to put it in, in, in perspective. But I mean, excuse me, we are actually going in a circle, a full circle, making it back how the two passages are connected. Because look at what he says the answer is, Why could we not cast one? But says, your, your unbelief is your unbelief. You have always been our unbelief for any time there is failure. Now, unbelief is not always the word that is used. Jesus often uses the word little faith. He often uses the word doubt. But you realize that the word little faith and doubt are, are, are synonymous to unbelief. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a kind of privilege to have um, your family with us this morning. Uh, don't tell it say you both. I said, so. <laughs> yes. And then, all right. So, so let 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 let's refocus now. Let's refocus because here's what we're looking for. Or oh, is it not? I'm just you know. right. But let's refocus a little bit on this perspective. What's the perspective? The perspective is the reason for failure is what now? Unbelief. All right. So we're looking at. What? One, it's not a note that must be moved from out of our mates, and two, 
that thing that so easily beset us. Now, we all are thinking that maybe this is the sin that so easily beset us. This one, maybe my temper, maybe so and so. That's not true. That's not true. Do you realize that there is only one sin? There's only one sin. It's separation from God or failing to believe God. You see the point? So, so we because we are not governed by the law, how can you say because I told a lie or because so and so? Is that you're not believing in your truth? And if you're not believing in your truth, then you're going to fall to the same works of the flesh that are described in the law. You understand what I'm saying? That's the perspective. So, so if we if we are looking carefully at what we're saying, what we're seeing happening here is that we are being told what is the yoke that is in our means and what is what. The sin that's so easy to beset us. You're seeing that, and I hope that you've seen that because he says this is the weight. This is the weight that is preventing us from running the race. As we all, this is the weight that he says um, is holding us back, and so we can't win. We're always in the face of the beat. All right, so let's see if we can if we can um, break down this perspective of unbelief for for a moment. Um, and. I think I did a sermon some time back called the Unbelief Connection. <laughs> so I want you to think um, about this unbelief for a moment because the word unbelief is a New Testament word. Think about this. The word unbelief is a New Testament. You don't find the word in the New Testament. The word unbelief is a New Testament word. In fact, let me see if I can find a, a quick hour. Right, so, in the first reference of the word is, is, in, um, is in Matthew 13, when Jesus went back to Nazareth. Do you remember the story? So, he went back to Nazareth, we were brought up, and he did not many mighty works there. The last verse of Matthew, of Matthew 13. Why? Because of their unbelief. Are you getting it? Because of their unbelief. So, let me ask you a question. Does the, the unbelief of people stop the power of God? From working for them. Right. So the only you can't stop the thought of God. The only you stop you from receiving from God. Is it the point? So what what why didn't he do my my my, my works? Because, because they did not complete, because they're only they kept they kept themselves away. In fact, if you look at the same passage in in, in Mark chapter six, he says he did not bear my work, saving or except he laid hands of two sick folks and healed them. Have you read that one? Mm -hmm. It's in Mark 6, talking about the same passage. So he could have done far more work than he did with those few, those few people. And the reason was because they did not believe. All right, that's one. The other, the other part, um, um, reference, I think, has to do with, well, we just looked at the disciples not being able to cast out the demon. I think it was because of who's the unbelief now? Yeah. Yeah. They're unbelief. And there's a passage that, that I'd like you to, to go, go to with me. We'll go to Mark 16. I, there's another reference there that, um, that I may have mentioned in that unbelief connection, um, Mark 16. And it was after Jesus was resurrected and he came to, 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 to see them. But look at verse 14, and we can read it from together. Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11, so Judas wasn't there. And did what now? Upgraded oh, them. That's, a, that's an interesting word. What does that word mean? Child. All right, child, probably. Um, well, it's a sharp word. You suppose some sharp words. Scolded them. That's a good one. Um, you put them to shame. That's another one. Um, and what else? Yeah. All right. So, so you, you get yeah. So you break them for what reason now? For the for their what? Yeah, you're yeah, bringing them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Why? Because they believe not, not the them which, which, which had seen him, him, him after he was risen. Right. Now, there is a there's a popular there's a popular concept. I think courts uses that too. Seeing is believing comes to courts. Yeah. Um, and there's that concept that says um, seeing is believing. I think Thomas was from courts. Our work of course was a product manager or something because Jesus said to him. Blessed are they that does not see Thomas and yet believe. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Right. So Thomas said, except I see him with my eyes, if I don't put my hands in his side, I'm not believing. So there are people who are like that. There are, are we don't believe except we see. 
And, and, and honestly, there are people like that. In other words, the, when the world challenges you as Christian, what do they say? Prove to me. They did that to Christ too. Are you the Son of God? What do you have to show? Prove to me that. Prove to us that you are the Son of God. And um, Jesus says that even an idolatrous generation seek it after a son. But no son will be given you. But he didn't give, give them a son. He said the son of Jonas is the problem. I remember? But interestingly, that will be after that he was resurrected that they would have seen the sign. Okay? All right. So if, I want you to see that there's that perspective of hardness of heart. So it is not just unbelief, but unbelief now he links it with hardness of heart. And now uh, there's another passage that I looked at in the sermon I mentioned um, where their hearts were hardened. Um, what was that? Oh, it was the story when Jesus went in the in the um in the in both to the other side and um he met them halfway and the moment he came in the in the boat the boat reached to the shore right and and so it was interesting what, what was said about their their the re reason why they they they, they found it so hard and it was the fact that their hearts were hardened and 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 and, they, and, and um, Jesus said because they did not remember. The, the, miracle, the, the miracle of the of the of the loaves and the fishes, right? Mm -hmm. So what what does the miracle of the loaves and the fishes have to do with with Jesus doing what he did? Mm -hmm. simply, if, if, they, if this man if this man was able to feed five thousand men beside women and children mm -hmm. with two loaves and um, two fish, two fish and five loaves, then what is so amazing that he steps in the boat and he reached the destination? That's the point. So he's saying, they, and then they, 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 the qualification, the qualification is that this was hardness of heart. No, could it be hardness of heart and or heart? What is the problem that that unbelief so easily is that? What's the problem that we we tend to to we believe everybody is except God? Isn't that true? Man, you know you don't feel well and you believe the doctor. The doctor says, oh, you don't know what is going on here. Something terrible, right? And all of a sudden you. Your blood pressure gone, so right because you believe the words of others. Where do you believe the word of God? And I believe the key to 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 what will happen in the end here, the key to to what we we will see happening to all the people in this world will be this: they will reach the place where they believe God more than they believe anybody else. Man, look at the deception that is taking place in the world. Look at the deception. You can't trust. You can't trust your government anymore. You can't trust the people in authority. You can't trust, right? So what are you going to do? Well, Jesus says, "Here I am. trust me." <laughs> we we'll be able to trust me. But that, that's the first thing. Anyway, let me just wrap it up here with um, <clears throat> how do you get rid of unbelief? Jesus says, "We have to fast." So we're coming right full circle to Isaiah 58 and recognizing this is the fast that he has chosen. And you know what I realized? I realized that who said that you should not be weary and well doing? I mean, know the scripture. But honestly, isn't it true that sometimes if the same people go through the same over and over after a while, you get tired? And we have this little thing that Jesus never said it, and I teach a man to fish so that um, you know how that to give him a fish, right? I mean, what verse is that again? <laughs> and, and I mean, we just look at the verse, and I mean, I mean we say, uh, he said, draw your soul to the hungry. Um, in what he said, what about your bread? <laughs> and he said, redeem your bread to the hungry. He said, bring those who are cast out to your homes. So you look at it and you can argue, and you say, oh, how can I do that? Right? I, can hardly, I can hardly make it for myself. Oh, I can take on one more person in the host of you, one more more. Right? So we all have, uh, we, we have these, but he said, what if you said you're not going to do it? If the people come to the host and they're home, we're going to say it's you. Right? And most times we don't do that. If we don't see, if we don't see the way out, we're not taking the we're not taking the chance. We must see the world, and that and Jesus says that's not faith. Faith is when you don't see, and yet you say you said so. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Do you see the point? All right. Let me, and I said I was wrapping it up. Um, here's what I would say though: the the most the most deadly crime against God is not to believe what He said. He did for us in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
That's the most deadly reference. You agree that that's the same? Right. So if if we say, if we say what God did for us does not apply to us, what have we said to God? Like in Hebrews, it says that if you um if you if you sin willfully after that you permit uh, you have, you have received if you sin willfully after that you are um, what is the verse saying? Okay, Hebrews eleven. Hebrews is uh, Hebrews ten and verse twenty six. Uh, if, if you sin willfully after that you are uh, and, 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 the, and the word is in my mouth. If you sin after you have received the knowledge, there may remain no more sacrifice for sin. But what, 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 what remains? A certain fearful looking for judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversary. Now, so I want you to see, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy if two or three people witness it. Right? Of what sort of punishment suppose he shall be taught worthy of? Who have chopped down the, the Son of God, have called to the blood of his covenant, where he was sanctified and an holy thing, and have done this type the spirit of grace. You know what Paul is saying? He's saying, I mean, there is no greater crime than to not believe God. And if you are everyone who will be lost, will be, will be guilty of that crime, not believing God. Do you understand why it's important for us to believe God, to have a demonstration of God, to have a witness in ourselves, that everybody will know this is the reality that we do have in Him. And most people, if they don't see that witness, how will they ever be drawn to God? <clears throat> Let me close with this. Just there's a point of observation. There are only two times in the record of Jesus' life that he ever said he was marveled. No, you don't you don't frighten Jesus and surprise Jesus very often. But there are only two times. That it says that he marveled. You remember when the first was? Your salvation. All right, not that one. The centurion. So when the centurion came and said, Don't come to my house, just keep the word, and it shall be done. He said, and he marveled. He marveled at what the centurion said. Because the centurion said, I'm a man under authority, I understand how this works. I said to this man, Do this, and he does it. I said, Go and he go. I said, Come, right. And so the next place, do you know what where that one is? You can check this out. So the first one is in what, what did I say? What, what reference was that? Matthew 8. And the second reference is in Mark 6. It says he marveled at their unbelief. He marveled at their unbelief. So um, <clears throat> the, 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 the perspective I want you to see, or in fact, let me just leave a, a quick verse here with you. Um, maybe I'll add another one. Um, but, but Hebrews 3 and verse 12 says it this way Take ye, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, we don't necessarily see unbelief as departing from God, right? But that's what Paul is saying. The evil heart of unbelief is actually separating you from your reality in Christ Jesus, right? And um, I, I want to encourage you, like like uh, Joseph had did to the brethren that when he to the people, he said, "Believe in the Lord God, so shall he be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall he prosper." Mm -hmm. The conditions, the conditions are clear. Only believe. The conditions are clear. John three sixteen. What does the condition say? He that believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Alright, go ahead, Mr. Lord. This morning I was speaking to someone about that like for instance, somebody dying who didn't have a like um relationship with Christ. Yeah. And yet still somebody would expect that they just say, Lord, have mercy upon you. Right. And then God will have mercy upon them. So the person was saying to me that maybe the only way that could work out is if that person had a relationship with Christ before and not slide, and realized that then he's in a situation where he's nearly dead, then they could call upon God and God for that answer. Okay, all right. So, so the question had to do with that has to do with um, someone saying that that you know the deathbed de deathbed deathbed confession that um that you can live as you please, and if you if you get a chance to say. 
Lord, forgive me, or save me right in the end, then you, it shall work, or it can work. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know the, the purpose of that, uh, where that, that argument came from. This is no. the thief on the cross. So with the thief on the cross um, was a thief. He was being, the consequences of his action was, was being carried out. But I suppose he never met Christ. He never knew of Christ. He never had that experience. And so there were two thieves. One reviled him, mm -hmm. and the other passed for salvation. Right. So from that now they say, well, anybody, if, you, if you're going to die and so on, you can do this. Now I'm not God. I suppose the mercies of God are so marvelous and and and, and, and great and abounds in such way that if you can that moment can actually mean what you say, mm -hmm. I mean you'll be saved. And so I can't say the person, no, stop him, not Steve. I can't make that judgment because God is just too merciful. He's just too loving, too forgiving for me to, to, to say something like that. As opposed to somebody saying it just in case they die. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With the idea that if they, if they yeah. come back to, if they come back to regular functioning, yes. then they will recant that. And can't take a living right. as they but some people choose that they say right. I'm going to wait until I'm yeah. dying right. right. which it cannot be sincere if you purposefully wait. Right. right. And so so we, we will argue that and say maybe maybe not, but still it's still the heart and only God knows the heart. Right. That's true. Uh, true. Uh, but he did say to the he said I tell you today. Mm -hmm. And somebody said no he said today you're going to come to paradise. No he says today I'm telling you this you shall be with me in paradise. All right, so anyway, I, I hope that you can, uh, we, 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 we did get something from the, 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 the study today in the, in the fact that there is always the conditions, if we can meet the condition. And I, and I, and I suppose, why is it that we, that, 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 let, me just, let me close it with a question. Be not careful, I'm going to keep going. Um, well, why is it that there seem to, when you look at history, when you, I, 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 met, a, I met a guy, well, virtually, I met a guy who, um, who ended up in Indonesia um, on some mission, married an uh, Indonesian girl, went to Indonesia, left college and everything, and, and got ministry. And he never had a clue about ministry, and then he went and, and, and got confronted, some demons confronted him and all of that. Anyway, he, um, he, he after a while, he, uh, after fear and all of that that came out, he, he started really trusting God and saw great deliverance, I think. He was probably among the first, and um, I forgot the era of English that he went. Anyway, um, but the, the perspective that, that, that I see is that until you lose faith in yourself and, and confidence in yourself, you'll never ever trust God. And that is really what God is waiting for. Sometimes it's not, it's not you, you hear the term that you'll never look up until you pat on your back. That's really the truth. You'll never, you'll never turn to God until you're in a, a terrible situation. And and still he's so loving that he still he says, "Come, come, my child. If this is the way I get you, I'll take you anywhere you come." Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, my encouragement really is this: that that we will um we will examine ourselves. And I can just see that this is so so essential to examine ourselves. Look at the, look at where we're heading. Look at the direction we're going, and see if we could be. Um, Jesus says, "Be, be careful that you're not." You're not enveloped in serpent in the drunkenness and the kids with this life, deceitfulness of riches, all of these different things. Let that moment come to anyone who wears. Because I know, I know, I know what it's like when when you reach a last moment, when 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 the death news come. I mean, I, I remember I was eight years old when my when my brother died, first death in my family. And I remember when my cousin, I mean, when you're when you're a unit, you don't have you, you don't you don't have protocols to break news, right? No time. And then you just run in the room and just burn out so it's a thing you did. Look here, man. I remember when my mother just just shot and said, Move! Right? I mean, you, you can't understand the kind of thing, but it comes from everything inside of our is saying is not true. Right? It's true. And, and, I, and, I, and I and I realize that's this. You look at the end and you realize it's going to come and you realize that I'm many people. I don't know what, what it was like. I don't know what that hollering and bawling was like outside of the car. Mm -hmm. But I know that, that they all knew that what this man was saying, or the time, length of time he was saying it, finally has come true. Right? Now, I'm hoping 
that for myself and for all of us here and for all of us who are now online, that we would have made that connection with him. And then it's not just the connection, the connection must be growing. And then that's what sometimes we don't think about. And most Christians don't think about the growth. We think about, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm saved, but no, it's just growing. And then if you're growing, then it should be that you are also helping others because that's why you were saved. You're saved, you're saved to serve. We are saved to evangelize. We are saved to bring to be a witness. That's that's your, your perspective. perspective. That's purpose. We are to a patient that you'll be a witness and that you'll be working hand in hand with him. Anyway, thank you so much for your time and your company today. And thank you, little man, for joining us and blessing us and gracing us with your presence and your voice. Um, let's let's go ahead and have, and have a prayer. Um,